I'm just super excited to, you know, to be in this position of uh, bringing our team to the to the final four to, to play in the third weekend of our tournament is, you know, is exciting, is special. Um, and it means that you 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 competed and beat um, some very, very, you know, good competition. Um, I, I thought our women's basketball tournament was exciting. Um, congratulations to all the teams, but you know, especially the three that that uh, that will be in the, the other three that will be in the final four. Thanks, Don. Uh, first question will come from Jonathan Tannewald. Thank you, Rick. Don, this is Jonathan Tannewald from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, you know, you've obviously been in Final Fours with Gino multiple times now, but to be in Minneapolis, going to Minneapolis with not just him in the Final Four, but also Cheryl being there with the Lynx and with USA Basketball, um, you know, what does that say to you about the resonance? continued residents of the Philly area in women's hoops, even though there's not a WNBA team yet, there's not a really top elite level D1 college team right now, but the three of you are out there flying the flag. Thanks. Um, I mean, I think it's great. I mean, Philly produces um, a lot of great talent, you know, uh, players, coaches. Um, and I think the reason that that occurs is because you know, sports is a, a lifestyle in Philadelphia. We, we we live and we die off of, you know, the the highs and lows of the Sixers, the Flyers, the Eagles, um, the Phillies, and because it because we put our <laughs> our sports teams under the gun so much, we know that we ourselves will be under the gun. Um, so we just prep well. We 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 also have tough skin to be able to handle whatever's thrown at us. But I, I'm not surprised to. To, to be sharing um, a space with Gino and Cheryl, um, you know they 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 are from our area, um, and we've been we've been raised the right way and the the right pedigree when it comes to being super competitive and finding ways to be successful. Thanks so much, and congrats on another great one. Thank you. Next question from Pat Eaton Rob. Coach, hi, Pat Eaton Rob from the Associated Press. Um, I was wondering if you could address, there seem to be just so many more eyes on the sport um, right now. And can you just talk about the showcase that having this many stars and these great teams in the Final Four presents and kind of as, as a follow-up, um, the NIL seems to have brought a lot of um, a lot of eyes to the sport as well through social media. And how do you think that is helping uh, grow the game uh, going into this final four? Um, yeah, it, it, here's the thing. Our, our game has always been rich with great coaches, great players, great competition. Um, I think we are, are starting to appreciate it a lot more because we, we, we're hearing about, you know, all the stories of our, you know, in our game. And, and, and this is what, this is what everybody's been asking for, for, for such a long time. It doesn't mean that doesn't mean that a team can't be dominant. Doesn't mean that you, you can't have several teams that are dominant. Um, it just means that um, there are stories that come along um, throughout our season that that begs to be heard about. And when you hear about more and more stories, it, it just really grows our game because we know that there are incredible, talented people uh, that that comprises our game and you know now we're hearing about them i think i think that the nil issue or not issue is not an issue it's a actually a, a really good um thing for our our student athletes um we're expanding you know i think individual by individual is expanding um our game in areas that we didn't reach before so it's 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 helping our game grow it's helping our student athletes um, provide for themselves, their families, and you know all the things that all the you know all the people that invested in them. You know, they're seeing the the fruits of their labor through NLI or NIL, and just playing some terrific bas basketball. Thanks for the question. Next up, Gene uh, Sapikoff. 
Don, congratulations. Um, how has the sports performance and conditioning routine in your program changed over the years and how important has that become? And then, Don, for you personally, I know you're super competitive in this, but what's your daily workout routine? Um, I mean, this, the sports performance piece is a huge piece. Like It is a piece that we decided several years ago that we were going to invest in. Uh, because uh, it it creates an edge. Uh, when I when I when I was here at South Carolina, when we actually ended up going to the NCAA tournament and actually getting to the you know the Sweet 16, I think we did that the first time out. Um, I was tired. Like I was tired because I wasn't really used to uh, playing during that time in March. Like I was like I felt more tired than than anything. And, and if I felt tired, I'm sure our players, there was a, you know, there was something in them that, you know, they may not have mentioned it or were aware of it um, because of the excitement. Um, But that's when I knew that, you know, this is, this is some serious stuff right here. And we, you know, we had, we were fortunate to have some of the very best sports performance coaches. Um, One, you know, the one that was took it to another level, her name is, Katie Fowler, she's not, she's not, she's not our sports performance uh, coach at the moment. But when she decided to go in a different direction, um, I asked her, "Who's the best? We want the, we only want the best, and you've made us, you put us in this position, so we can't go backwards." Um, Molly, at Molly, Molly has come in, and during the, during the, the, you know, the interview process, I, I said I would like for for the, for her position to to be a um, not just get our team where it needs to, to be, but also just our players' lifestyle. I want them to be aware of how much um, right now in college really has an impact on what the rest of your life can look like um, and feel like when you you know when you take fitness pretty seriously. Um, my daily routine during the season is I just walk. I, I, I probably get in a, you know, an hour on a treadmill or an hour and 15 minutes if I go out and walk on the trail. Um, if I'm lucky, I, I lift maybe once, once a week. Um, I wish I could do more, but that's all, that's all the time that I have. Thanks for the question. Uh, next up be Kent Youngblood. Congratulations, Coach. Uh, Ken Youngblood from the Minneapolis Star Tribune here. We're uh, eagerly awaiting your arrival. Um, I I wanted to ask you, you often describe what you do as being a dream merchant for for the kids that you work with. And and it seems like, you know, given your work trying to further the efforts of uh, women of color in coaching, it seems like you kind of do the same thing for them. When you look at all you've accomplished and and all the wins you've had, all the titles, when this is all over, what are you going to be most proud of the games you won or maybe the impact you had on the game? Um, I mean, for me, uh, I, I want to be known as or, or remembered as an odds beater. That's one. I mean, then the other, you know, I, I, I got a, uh, I got a text this morning, uh, from a, from a really good friend. And, you know, as you, as you walk this this path, walk this path of whatever you're supposed to be, whoever you're supposed to be, and wherever you're supposed to go, and wherever you're supposed to touch, um, I don't really stop to think about it. I just, I mean, I'm just acting. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Like I'm comfortable in my skin, and I'm comfortable being uncomfortable and making other people uncomfortable when it's for the right thing. So I, I think what I, I want that this what I want is um, to have generational impact. That's what I would like to have generational impact, not to just impact my current players and my players, but to have impact on um, people who will have impact on people who will have impact on other people. Thanks for the question. Next up, Howard McDowell. Hey, Don, good to see you. Uh, Howard Meddahl from The Next in 538. 
Uh, I, I just wanted to get a status report, essentially, of where you think your offense is at this point. You're coming off a game where you shot 51% from the field and had seven turnovers. As we know, your you know, defense and rebounding is elite enough. It's not like the offense needs to be uh, similarly elite, but do you see it as performing at the level where you want it to be going into these final two most important games? Um, I, I, we're just going, we're just going to play the game. Like, you know, I think a lot of people have questioned our offense throughout the tournament. Um, and, (laughs) and it just seems to be our team that's been targeted, um, about what our offense is doing. And, you know, no other team has been targeted in the way that our team has, um, we're 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 playing good basketball, you know. Whether our shooting percentage is in the 30s or in the 50s, uh, I don't think we're taking bad shots. So if we're taking bad shots. Then we have, you know, we have issues. We're just taking good shots that aren't going in. At some point, at some point, um, those shots will go in. And I thought they did it. They did a great job of finding themselves, um, um, finding them, finding them fall you know, through the, through the rim on, on Sunday. So I hope that's, you know, that's, that, that will remain the case, but I hope that we do what we need to do to win basketball games and just uh, be able to survive and advance to Sunday. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Thanks for the question. Next up, Chris Thomason. Yeah. Uh, hi, Don. Chris Thomason, St. Paul Pioneer Press. Connecticut is returning to the final four site minneapolis where they won their first title in 1995 um hoping you can look back that 1994-95 connecticut team how iconic was that team and maybe the way it helped raise the popularity of women's basketball and perhaps even played a role in the wnba being formed a couple years later um i don't i only remember yesterday you know, I need to go back to 95. Like, I'm I'm 25 years old in 95. That's over half of my age. Um, I mean, Connecticut has done a great job at advancing our, our, our sport. No doubt about it. Um, um, you know, as far as the WNBA, um, their, their success... I don't, I mean, it, it was, that was just the beginning of, of UConn. I don't know if they had an impact on whether or not we, we'd have a, a WNBA league. Um, that was probably 10 years in the making or, or at least five years in the making. So we, it pushes it back to 95. And I don't even, I don't even know. I got, hey, Renee, you know, when the WNBA, just the, the, the beginning talks. I got I got Renee Brown. I got a historian, you know, sitting in my office and she worked for the league for 20 years from its inauguration until 20 years. So she said it it, it probably had, you know, a little bit, you know, thought behind, you know, maybe years before it actually came to fruition. Um, you know, so we're going to have to probably give the, the 96 team um, a little bit of credit for um just giving us a premonition of what women's basketball could look like from a professional standpoint. Well, let me ask you one more thing on another historical topic. I can this take you back 50 years, but this weekend in Minneapolis, they're uh, honoring the 50th anniversary of Title IX. They're over at the Mall of America. They're having uh, a big thing with displays and that sort of thing. Just how do you feel about them honoring Title IX this weekend at the Final Four? Um, I I mean, I think it's pretty cool. Title IX provided opportunities for for girls and women um, to have an opportunity to, um, the same opportunities as, uh, you know, our male counterparts. And um, we're we're here 50 50 years later, but we still, we still um, um, are, are, are not, 
treated in the same manner. So I, I hope that 50 years and this impact has been pretty good. I think we've got room to grow. So 50, hopefully 50 years later, you know, we will be celebrating, you know, a more equitable, uh, um, a more equitable uh, impact on, 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 on our sports. Thanks for the question. Next up, uh, Randall Gim. Go ahead. Thank you very much. This is Randall Gim with Nuts and Bolts Sports. Thank you for being here this morning, Don. I wanted to ask you about your assistant coaches and what they've brought to the table this season and throughout this tournament run. Great question. Um, I mean, everything like, you know, we, they, they, they're the ones that really make our program go. Um, they prepare us. Um, they're super competitive. You know, they, you know, they, they help each other out. We're, we're, you know, we're, I guess, uh, Friday night. Uh, when we played our game and then we had to watch the Iowa State and the Creighton um, play, get back to the hotel around midnight, and it's Coach Boyer Scout like Creighton. She's like, <laughs> she's like, how do I, you know, how, where do I start? You know, where, you know, how can we get our great team in a place where we can, you know, we can actually just kind of you know, simulate it a little bit, their, their movements and their actions. And then, and then um, we're all, you know, met in my, in my room and we were discussing it. And then, um, you know, Fred Shamil, um, actually Boyer asked Fred to, you know, could you just, could you just look at their, you know, their motion and I'll, I'll get the rest of the stuff. And then he, he took it on and we, we hammered it out. Um, you know, three hours later, they left my room. I, I thought we had one of the best practices, just having one day to prepare for a team like Creighton, like one of the best, one of the best, one of the most organized. And it came from a team effort standpoint. Um, and I just, it, 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 you know, you, you, you try to come up with a game plan to, you know, to, to play a team like Creighton and you, you, you got so many, ideas. I mean, they threw so much stuff at me to say, hey, we need to do this, we need to do that. We need... And then we, when it boils down to it, it was just do what we've been doing. Um, but it was great to hear their, you know, their thought process, their ideas and how um, to get us over, to get us over the hump. Because we know the Elite Eight game is a really hard game um, and it's a real nerve wracking, but they give me great um, peace knowing that knowing that whatever anyone throws at us one of them's going to catch it and it ain't um, catch what they're doing and it, it won't be from a place of uh silence because they're always giving you know information as to what's happening throughout the game and outside the game so it's pretty pretty cool you know having a tight-knit staff like we do thank you so much don that was a great answer Thanks for the question. Uh, we are going to have to skip around just because of uh, the shortness of time. But next up, I'll go to Nancy Armour with USA Today. Hey, Don, thanks for doing this. Um, I wanted to follow up earlier on the earlier earlier question about the role that you've played in in opening doors for other people in the sport, not just players, but other coaches. And you've talked about the importance of, of you all doing it for yourselves, but the fact that it, um, you've made a particular emphasis or, or particular point of opening doors and, and helping young black women coaches in the game. Why is that so important? Sounds like an obvious question, I know. Um, but what what did you take from earlier in your career that you wished you had seen? Or, you know, how much does that influence what you're doing too, that maybe what you didn't see when you were a young coach? I mean, it, it, here's the thing. <clears throat> When I when I first got into coaching, or or actually just before be beyond that, like I I've been one that I've grown up in our game, and I and I play the game I played the game just for the pure, um, just innocence, you know, just did it because I I really love to compete, 
I love to get better. I love the want to 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 be the best. And that to me is just that was just my normal train of thinking. And then as you grow in the sport, um, you you see things. And then when you when you become a coach, you see more things. Like, you know, I I was probably blinded to the fact that, you know, I'm a black coach. Like, like blinded. I'm just coaching because I, I want to help other people. I want to be a dream merchant for young people because I, you know, my my basketball career as a player was, you know, my cup running over. And I wanted other people to feel that. And then you get into coaching. And then I, I truly believe other people make you look at the color of your skin, by how they treat you, uh, by how you 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 aren't, you know, top tier when it comes to opportunities to coach. Um, you know, somebody has to really failed for black women to, to, to get an opportunity. And then when they get an opportunity, if they fail, you know, you're reduced to being an assistant coach. You don't get recycled to another head coaching position. Um, now we're we're back. I think I, I don't I don't know, maybe maybe 10 years ago there was an influx of hiring. The thing was to hire a black woman. Um, I think we're back at that place now where black women are, you know, on the on the top, you know, tier of, you know, ADs wanting wanting a, a black coach to head a, a female head black a female black coach. Male black coaches, they don't have a shot. Okay. So that's my that's on my that's my next thing. It's my next thing. But um now it's it's more popular right now to, to hire a black coach. I, I think uh, you know, you know, I, I look at our, our league, the SEC. I think we have five. Five, I think we have five. Um nowhere in the country that 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 mirrors that look. And and we 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 talk about it. The five of us, we talk about it. We we lift each other up. We got we got a group thread. And when they, when anybody gets a big win, they, we, we're texting because we know that if we don't, if we aren't successful, we go back, we go back down, um, and and never to, and gotta wait another ten years to get another, another go at it. So I, I just feel like black female coaches have been, um. The voiceless, the the one that the ones that don't really get the opportunity to to fail. <laughs> That's we don't get the opportunity to fail. We it is win at all costs, and if you don't, you don't seek a, another opportunity. I mean, what we got one of them, Jolette Law. She was one of those coaches ten years ago that got the opportunity. Um, I think she got about four years to succeed and it didn't happen. She's been an assistant coach, a top assistant coach in our game, you know, for these past 10 years. And maybe she's a, a little more selective in, in in the jobs that she go after um, because she's been she's been scarred. <laughs> she's been scarred. Um, but it's popular to hire a black coach now. So maybe she'll get, you know, some some decent looks to where it is somewhere that will give her a chance to be successful. I know it was a long-winded um, answer. I apologize for that, but we, there's a little bit of history behind it. Thanks so much. Uh, and Don, thanks so much for, for being with us today. I know you need to get to practice, so we look forward to having you in Minneapolis. And thanks to all the media for being with us as well. We will have an ASAP transcript at the end. But Don, uh, you know, good, good luck, and we'll see you in Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you all.